a 23-year-old young mother mysteriously vanished, and her three-year-old son claimed that his dad had killed his mom. However, after a thorough investigation by the police, it's revealed that the three-year-old had a habit of telling lies. Moreover, the young mother had been planning to leave home, leaving the police uncertain about the nature of the case. Was it a murder or a missing person's case? It wasn't until 22 years later, when the three-year-old child grew into an adult, that the truth finally surfaced. The central figure in this case is named Bonnie Hyam, born on May 20, 1968, in Jacksonville, Florida. In 1985, at the age of 17, Bonnie crossed paths with her future husband, Michael Hyam. They tied the knot officially on September 12, 1987. Michael came from a relatively well-off background. His aunt, Evan Hyam, was a successful entrepreneur. After graduating from school, he joined his aunt's company and, with her guidance, quickly rose to become a department manager. Through Michael's recommendation, his wife Bonnie also took on an accounting role at Avene's company. The young couple, having achieved good positions and income shortly after graduation, was enviable. Just three years into their marriage, they had a son named Aaron. On weekdays, they commuted together to work, and on weekends, they would take their son out for outings. To outsiders, this family seemed content and happy, but the reality was different. On a day in January 1993, their seemingly perfect life took an unexpected turn. January 7, 1993, a Thursday. The Jacksonville Police Department received a call from Michael, reporting that his wife Bonnie was missing, and he hoped the police could assist in finding her. Upon receiving the report, the police immediately arrived at Michael's home to gather information. Michael's mother, Carolyn, was also present. According to Michael, the night before around 11 p.m., he and Bonnie had a heated argument. Furious, Bonnie grabbed her bag and left the house. Immediately, Michael called his mother, Carolyn, to explain the situation and asked her to come and take care of their three-year-old son. This would enable him to go out and search for his wife, Bonnie. Carolyn had always held a deep affection for her daughter-in-law and rushed over upon hearing that Bonnie had left home. Michael searched outside for nearly an hour but couldn't find his wife. Eventually, he reluctantly returned home, hoping Bonnie would come back on her own. Yet, by the time of the next day's work hours, Bonnie had still not shown up. Bonnie had always been diligent and responsible at work, never missing a day without cause. Michael grew increasingly anxious about his wife's safety. After discussing the situation with his mother Caroline, they decided to call the police for help. However, based on Michael's account, the police initially dismissed Bonnie's disappearance as a mere lover's quarrel, not giving it much weight. They refrained from launching a large-scale search, thinking that Bonnie would return home after she cooled down. But soon enough, the authorities realized that the situation wasn't as simple as they thought. Later that afternoon, airport staff spotted an illegally parked black sedan near the airport. Unable to locate the owner, they contacted the police. Investigation revealed that the owner of this black sedan was none other than the missing Bonnie. Additionally, near a dumpster close by, the police found Bonnie's brown backpack containing several hundred dollars in cash, car keys, and her identification documents. This discovery left the police uneasy. People who leave home voluntarily don't typically discard such important personal belongings. It was clear that Bonnie's disappearance was more complex than initially presumed. Moreover, upon inspecting Bonnie's black sedan, the police noticed that the driver's seat was adjusted to a position quite far back. This was a significant clue. Bonnie was barely 5 feet 3 inches tall, and with the seat positioned so far back, she wouldn't have been able to reach the gas and brake pedals. But the most crucial piece of evidence was a distinct footprint of a sports shoe found inside the car. The shoe's size was significantly larger than Bonnie's, clearly indicating a male presence. The police had reasons to suspect that Bonnie might have been abducted or worse. In situations like these, a spouse is often the primary suspect in cases involving a missing wife. So, the police paid a second visit to Michael's home. Upon examining his shoe closet, they found a pair of sports shoes that perfectly matched the footprint left in Bonnie's car. 
the sizes were identical too. Michael came under intense suspicion, yet due to the uncertainty surrounding Bonnie's fate, whether she was alive or dead, the police couldn't definitively label Michael as the prime suspect and lacked the authority to make an arrest. With Bonnie's whereabouts still unknown and her fate hanging in the balance, the police had to cast a wide net for more leads. In this process, the hidden secrets between Michael and Bonnie, concealed from the world, gradually began to emerge. As per the police investigation, Michael and Bonnie's relationship was far from the picturesque image they projected to the world. In reality, their marriage was extremely tumultuous. Michael was a highly controlling individual. He insisted that Bonnie hand over her entire monthly salary to him. Even her daily choices of clothing and destinations needed his approval. Disobeying his wishes resulted in physical abuse. Michael showed scant respect for Bonnie, often berating and humiliating her in public. Gradually, Bonnie entertained the idea of divorce, yearning to escape this oppressive atmosphere. However, she feared retaliation from Michael upon discovering her intentions. So, she covertly opened a bank account, intending to accumulate funds to move out with her son. Yet, Michael soon uncovered this plan. Not only did he force Bonnie to close the bank account, he also transferred the money she had saved into his own account. Undeterred, Bonnie persisted in her plans to leave. She began stashing her savings at a friend's house, refusing to deposit money in a bank account. In January 1993, she finally managed to accumulate $1,230 and secured a distant apartment. The plan was to wait until Michael was on a business trip and then move with her son, escaping his clutches. But just as Bonnie's plan seemed poised for success, she vanished mysteriously. This fueled strong suspicions that Michael might have killed Bonnie in a fit of rage after discovering her intentions. Even Michael's aunt, Evan, firmly believed this. Despite being Michael's aunt and related by blood, she did not approve of his character. In fact, she had witnessed Michael using a car door to crush Bonnie's fingers, which only fueled her aversion toward him. If not for the sake of Michael's parents, Evan might have fired him from her company. Conversely, Evan held great affection for Bonnie. She saw her as a kind, intelligent young woman. During questioning by the police, Evan didn't shield her nephew, Michael. Instead, she revealed everything she knew to the authorities. This yielded a crucial lead. According to Evan, on the night of Bonnie's disappearance, January 6, 1993, she and Bonnie had initially planned to go to a night market together. However, around 8.30 p.m., Bonnie called to cancel, her voice hoarse, as if she had been crying. Evan inquired and learned that Bonnie had just had another heated argument with her husband, Michael. She was too upset to go out that night. The police astutely noted the discrepancy between Evan's statement and Michael's testimony. Michael claimed the argument with Bonnie began around 11 p.m., and she left the house in anger after that. This contradicted Evan's account by over two hours. Michael had lied about the timing of their argument. During these two-plus hours, Michael had ample opportunity to do many things, hide Bonnie, or even worse, commit murder and dispose of her body. Pulling together all the information gathered, the police developed a plausible scenario. At around 8.30 p.m., after Bonnie's call to her Aunt Evan, she and Michael are believed to have resumed their argument. It's suspected that Michael impulsively killed Bonnie at that moment. He then used her black sedan to dispose of her body somewhere intentionally left her car near the airport, discarded her backpack to create the illusion of her leaving, and finally returned home around 11.30 p.m. He then called his mother, Caroline, asking her to come and take care of his three-year-old son, using her presence to reinforce the illusion that his wife had run away. While the police's speculation made sense and Michael's motive and timing were fitting, sadly, they lacked concrete evidence. Without finding Bonnie, they couldn't take any legal action against Michael. Their hopes hinged on a crucial eyewitness. Following Bonnie's disappearance, her three-year-old son, Aaron, remained inconsolable. A doctor's diagnosis revealed that Aaron was grappling with psychological issues. Further inquiry unveiled the chilling truth. Three-year-old Aaron had actually witnessed his father kill his mother. In his innocent voice, he recounted to the doctor, I saw Daddy shoot Mommy with a gun, and then Mommy fell asleep and didn't wake up again. 
Aaron's testimony unequivocally pointed to Michael's guilt. However, Bonnie's father surprisingly stepped forward to defend Michael, asserting that Aaron had a habit of lying and therefore his words couldn't be wholly trusted. Bonnie's father even explicitly stated that until he saw his daughter's body, he was willing to believe in Michael's innocence. This might have been due to a refusal to accept his daughter's death or for undisclosed reasons. Regardless, his statements significantly undermined Aaron's credibility. Coupled with Aaron's age of only three, which typically results in limited testimonial weight, the court ultimately ruled his testimony as an admissible evidence. This meant that until Bonnie's remains were found, the police couldn't take legal action against Michael. From a legal standpoint, Michael remained an innocent man. Despite deploying extensive resources in search of Bonnie for a prolonged period, the police were ultimately unsuccessful. Gradually, Bonnie's disappearance case turned into a cold case. While the police searched for Bonnie, Michael pursued custody of their son Aaron. His motivation wasn't rooted in genuine care for the boy, but rather in securing the death compensation Bonnie left behind. This custody battle persisted until 1999, culminating in a final trial verdict. During this period, Aaron was placed in foster care due to Michael's severe violent tendencies and Aaron's potential status as a witness to Bonnie's disappearance. The court revoked Michael's custody rights, deeming neither his nor Bonnie's family suitable for Aaron's upbringing. Aaron was placed with another unfamiliar family for adoption, and he was renamed Aaron Fraser. In 2005, with the assistance of his adoptive parents, Aaron took Michael to court. He accused Michael of embezzling his late mother Bonnie's inheritance and demanded compensation for years of child support. The civil court ruled that Michael must pay $2,630 in compensation to his son Aaron and transferred the ownership of the old family house they had lived in to Aaron. However, Aaron was still a minor at 14 and didn't inhabit the house. He rented it out instead. It wasn't until 2014, when Aaron was 24, that he decided to renovate the Jacksonville house and move in himself. This decision eventually led to Michael facing the consequences of his actions after more than 20 years of eluding justice. In December 2014, the 24-year-old Aaron hired a worker to demolish the long-abandoned backyard swimming pool and build a new one. While breaking the concrete slabs of the old pool, they unexpectedly unearthed a black plastic bag buried in the soil. Out of curiosity, they opened the bag and discovered a human skull. Shocked and unnerved, they promptly dialed 911. The police swiftly arrived and continued excavating the area around the pool, eventually uncovering a complete human body. Forensic examination confirmed that the remains belonged to Bonnie Hyam, missing for 21 years. A distinct gunshot wound on her skull was evident. Coincidentally, Michael had possessed a firearm of the same caliber as the bullet used in her murder. Furthermore, prior to transferring the house's ownership to Aaron, Michael ensured every rental agreement stipulated that tenants were prohibited from altering or beautifying the backyard, an apparent attempt to prevent the discovery of Bonnie's remains. At long last, Michael faced the consequences of his heinous crime, brought to justice due to Aaron's decision to reclaim his family's old home. On August 21, 2015, Michael, aged 49, was arrested in Waynesville, North Carolina, and brought back to Jacksonville, the site of the incident, awaiting the wheels of justice to turn. On April 8, 2019, at the age of 53, Michael was formally charged with the murder of Bonnie by the prosecution. As the trial began, Aaron appeared as the key witness in court, facing his biological father once more. The emotions within Aaron were tumultuous, since witnessing his mother's murder at the age of three, he had lived in constant fear. Starting from his understanding of the world, Aaron placed a brick under his pillow every night as he slept, fearing that his father might suddenly appear to end his life. Even a silhouette resembling his father would send him into a nameless terror, triggering his instinct to flee. However, today was different. Aaron had no intention of running away any longer. He wanted to personally conquer the fear that had haunted him for over two decades. Summoning his courage, Aaron once again recounted the harrowing truth he witnessed at the tender age of three, his father, Michael, murdering Bonnie. This time, no one could dismiss his testimony based on his age. 
the court took Aaron's account seriously. Nevertheless, Michael remained defiant, refusing to admit guilt. He claimed he loved his wife Bonnie and had never taken her life. However, the jury wasn't swayed by his lies. In May 2019, the jury unanimously found Michael Hayam guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced him to life imprisonment. With that, the curtain finally closed on the Bonnie Hayam disappearance case that had lingered for 26 years. Alongside that closure, the fear that had tormented Aaron for more than two decades also dissipated. Well, that concludes this edition of the video. Now, what are your thoughts on this case? Feel free to leave your comments below. As always, remember to take care of yourselves. Love you all.